want to welcome you all here to the uh, AFA, NDIA, and ROA Space Seminar on uh, Space Power to the Warfighter. My name is Peter Husey, and I want to welcome you all here, and uh, particularly our guests from the uh, number of countries of Hungary, Denmark, France, and Great Britain, as well as our military colleagues. I want to particularly say thank you to Pam Kunze and uh, Haley James of the Admiral Staff who uh, did yeoman's work in uh, making this uh, uh, event uh, take place. In February, we have Dr. Mr. David Madden, who is the Space and Missiles Center in California, who talk about future concepts and evolved systems on the 6th of March. Our problem in April is it's Good Friday, is the first Friday. And I want to have the two new chairmen of the Space Caucus, uh, Congressman Schiff and Congressman Lamborn, want to speak. But it's a tough month because a lot of that April they're away. But we will work it out and let you know who is going to be speaking in April. And then in May, we're going to have Lieutenant General Ellen Polakowski, who will be our speaker. Uh, my regular breakfast series on missile defense and nuclear deterrence starts April 14th. Uh, with Steve Blank and Mark Schneider on uh, are going to be talking about our uh, about Russia and uh, European theater and missile defense and nuclear issues. Also in Utah, we're uh, the next in our seventh of our series on the Triad. It's going to take place the 18th to the 20th in Salt Lake, in uh, Ogden, Utah. It's going to be in conjunction with the Scowcroft Dinner, which is a long-running dinner in Ogden in honor of our Air Force colleagues in the missile business in the ICBM business. And also want to let you know that the Precision Strike Annual Review March 17 and 18th event is going to be here in Springfield, Virginia. Um, those of you who haven't signed up, it's an NDIA event. Um, are we honored today to have Admiral uh, Haney here from Strat Command. Um, I'm going to make your introduction, sir, very, very short that you are the commander of STRATCOM. He has been a speaker at our breakfast series last year in July. He spoke at our triad symposium in September. He also spoke uh, at another event that I helped arrange with the Hudson Institute. Uh, he is uh, an extraordinary talented uh, admiral and friend and colleague and has uh, probably one of the toughest jobs in the country, short of the president. Uh, and he's done a remarkable job. And he's here to share with us uh, what the space imperatives are for the future, and so we all welcome our Strat Commander, Admiral Haney. Thank you, sir. I was going to say, this, this will be funner without a speech. But, uh, <laughs> well, good morning. And uh, thank you, uh, Peter, for that kind introduction, and also want to thank the Mitchell Institute for partnering uh, with uh, the Air Force Space Command and getting this series started last year, I am to understand. You know, Peter is sort of like a tribal chieftain. You know, he does so well at getting uh, the caliber of people, you know, assembled here, and I thank you for that. It's fantastic to see the diverse audience we have here, members associated with working with Congress and industry, tank think tanks, media, international presence, as was mentioned, and more. And when you couple it all together, it's just so important to have uh, that diversity and perspectives all coupled together here. Really important when you look at addressing the challenges we have in space today. So thank you all for being here. I must say, uh, particularly well done also in timing this event. We obviously are not distracted by the Super Bowl. And I will say, without the capabilities we have in space, some of us likely may not have enjoyed KT Perry's stunning halftime performance, <laughs> and of course, all those wonderful commercials and uh, the countless replays of those last few minutes. Seriously, it's great to be here representing the sailors, soldiers, airmen, and Marines, and civilians of US Strategic Command. Given the importance of space today, I salute this breakfast series theme of space power to the warfighter, and I hope to prime the pump for future discussions over the next few months. So let's get started. Given the number of missions, responsibilities assigned to US Strategic Command, some might view 
these as a set of disconnected missions from strategic deterrence, space and cyberspace operations, global strike, combating weapons of mass destruction, missile defense, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, and joint electronic warfare. But the totality of these missions allow us to address them in a very connected manner. And we operate from under the sea to geosynchronous orbit. When I took command about 15 months ago, the nuclear enterprise was under scrutiny. And we've worked especially hard in this area over the past year. While we continue to maintain a keen focus on this area, we are also putting similar steadfast efforts towards other capabilities, such as space, which is fully integrated in our joint military operations and underpins every part of our global economy, including our civil and commercial infrastructure. As a military, we rely on precision navigation, timing, imaging, signals, and electric electronic information to conduct missions across the full spectrum of operations. As a commander of Strategic Command, I also rely on space as a foundation for my nuclear deterrence mission, a key part of that being our national and nuclear command and control and communications capability. For example, space helps us with our surveillance and reconnaissance efforts to detect and assess threats. Our space-based missile warning systems provide nearly instantaneous warning of missile and bomber threats. Our navigational satellites provide the capability for weapons and warfighters to reach their targets. And our communication satellites allow us to communicate with the warfighters. While we look at space capabilities as relatively modern, it's hard to believe it's been less than six decades since Russia surprised the world with the launch of Sputnik. And the United States put our first satellite in space four months later. Now, I was just a toddler at the time. And while my daughter often calls me a dinosaur, the transformation of space over the past 57 short years is incredible. Think about it. Just four years after the US launched that first satellite, Alan Shepard became the first American in space. And just 10 years later, 44 years ago today, he was the first man to golf on the moon, establishing, perhaps, the first lunar handicap. <laughs> when the first GPS satellite was launched 37 years ago this month, I am sure most would not have understood that GPS would become the multi-billion dollar industry it is today. And how essential it would become to users around the globe from commercial banking, weather forecasting, navigating, farming, and paying for gas at the pump with your credit card. The point is, and as you all are aware of, as a country we depend on space, as do most other nations around the globe. Over the past 20 years, innovations in space technology have significantly changed the global landscape and due to the continued enhancement and significant proliferation in these technologies, as well as the subsequent lower cost of entry, there are now more than 170 countries that have access to space capabilities. Now, while the United States has clearly benefited from these technologies, we have reached a point where the space environment is at risk from both space debris and other space farers. So this morning, I'd like to spend a few moments talking about the trends in space where the playing field advantage is changing, and not exactly in the favor of like-minded nations seeking assurance of freedom of access to space. When we talk about the role of space in 21st century deterrence and some of our ongoing and future opportunities. Today, our nation is dealing with a global security environment that is more complex and dynamic and volatile than any time in our history. It's laden with multiple actors operating across multiple domains, challenging our democratic values and our security in multiple ways. In addition to significant tensions involving nation states, we are in an environment that is flanked with numerous ungoverned, 
or ineffectively governed areas that are breeding grounds for bad actors, including violent extremist organizations, who are also using space and cyberspace to recruit and spread propaganda, including misinformation, in support of their cause. Perhaps of greater concern is the proliferation of these emerging strategic capabilities, attempting to limit our decision space in our maneuver space and ultimately impacting strategic stability. Focusing more specifically on the impact of emerging capabilities in space, we know today that the space domain is more congested, contested, and competitive and increasingly <coughs> vulnerable. So let me put this in context for you. First, congestion is a huge problem. My Joint Space Operations Center located in Vandenberg Air Force Base in California routinely tracks more than 17,000 objects the size of a softball or larger, which means there are many smaller objects that we're not able to track. Of those who do track, of those we do track, about 1,200 of those objects are satellites, the rest are debris, increasingly threatening our operations satellites as they travel at speeds more than 17,000 miles per hour. Complicating this already crowded environment, we're seeing an increasing <laughs> number of small satellites. And while they are valuable, low-cost research platforms, the potential for damage to the world's satellite constellations increases as their numbers grow. Last summer, a Russian Depner rocket launched a record-breaking 37 satellites deploying a cluster of spacecraft for scientific research and commercial operations from a variety of countries. I believe the prior record was 34 in January of 2014. It's amazing. CubeSats have been involved in more than 360,000 close approaches of less than three miles with other orbiting objects. Now consider for a moment the devastating effects of just one collision and what it could have on our financial and economic sectors and our ability to conduct military operations. To help combat this overarching problem of space debris, last year <coughs> my Joint Space Operations Center that I mentioned in California, led by Lieutenant General Jay Raymond, who is my component commander for space, notified more than 8,000 owners and operators of close conjunction avoidance maneuvers, including three involving the International Space Station. And they continued to log about 23 collision warning notifications per day. Now, unlike the margin of victory experienced by the Patriots in our most recent <coughs> Super Bowl, we can ill afford to wait for that, those waning seconds in space to improve our margins. Imagine how these trends will continue to grow as competition increases and more countries continue to develop indigenous launch capabilities, or as the decreasing prices afford this capability to more actors. North Korea, for example, has been busy upgrading their launch facilities. And Iran, just this past week, successfully launched a satellite into orbit after a string of failures. China has publicly stated that its goal for the next decade is to outperform all other nations in space, investing large amounts of money into increasing the number of platforms in every orbital regime and increasing their influence in global situational awareness, space situational awareness. But it's not just these countries that recognize the strategic value of having space assets. Countries such as India and Japan, as well as Vietnam, Bulgaria, and Indonesia, just to name a few, are also expanding and are pursuing capabilities in space. Further confounding U.S. advantages in space is an increasingly contested environment in which other actors are seeking to take away the strategic advantage the United States has enjoyed by exploiting what they perceive as our space vulnerabilities. 
As Congress uh, noted in the, one of their bills there in April of 2014, our critical U.S. national security space systems are facing a serious growing threat. For example, multiple countries have developed and are frequently using military jamming capabilities designed to interfere with satellite communications and GPS. While we remain concerned with these growing capabilities <coughs> of the globe, we must pay uh, particular attention to China and Russia. Both countries have acknowledged that they are developing or have developed counter space capabilities. Both countries have advanced directed energy capabilities that could be used to track or blind satellites disrupting key operations. And both have demonstrated the ability to perform complex maneuvers in space. In 2007, and at least twice over the past two years, China has demonstrated a hit-to-kill anti-satellite technology. Thankfully, the last two didn't do what the first one did. You may recall in 2007 where it created thousands of pieces of debris, adding significantly to the congestion we experience in the space environment today. As news reporting last year indicated, Russia launched an interesting object with three military communication satellites. Originally thought to be debris, this object, referred to in the media as Object E, has our attention following some very curious non-debris-like maneuvers. So that's the space environment, but how does space fit into 21st century strategic deterrence? Deterrence, as you know, is impacting an adversary's perception and subsequent decision calculation to shape their behavior. So to effectively deter adversaries and potential adversaries from threatening our space capabilities, we must also understand their capabilities and their intent and make it clear that no adversary will gain the advantage they seek by attacking our space assets. We must apply all instruments of power and elements of deterrence. As stated in the 2011 National Security Space Strategy, quote, we will support diplomatic efforts to promote norms of responsible behaviors in space, pursue international partnerships that encourage potential adversary restraint, improve our ability to attribute attacks, strengthen the resilience of our architectures to deny the benefits of attack, and retain the right to respond should deterrence fails." End quote. As a nation, th then, we must fully recognize that the role of space in 21st century deterrence enables all elements of national power, which must be brought together more effectively to achieve strategic deterrence. Now, while this synopsis may appear daunting, know that we are working hard to ensure we maintain the strategic advantages <coughs> we expect in space today. We are approaching these through operational planning, leadership attention, and resiliency solutions. First, operational planning. We must ensure we are prepared for all phases of potential conflict. And that is a task that I've given my component commander for space, Jay Raymond. First, his team must characterize the operational environment allowing for timely and accurate warning and assessments of threats, enabling senior leader decision making. Second, his team must also support national users as well as joint and coalition forces, allowing them to operate in contested environments. And third, his team must protect and defend space capabilities and be prepared to execute contingency operations by developing tools, new tactics, techniques, and procedures, <coughs> partnerships, and command and control relationships. So how are we doing? To improve our ability to see and understand the domain, we are working on several new capabilities, both in low Earth orbit and geosynchronous orbit. To enhance our capability of tracking objects in 
low Earth orbit, our space fence program will work in conjunction with the rest of our space surveillance network to provide the Joint Space Operations Center an integrated picture of the joint operating environment, providing significantly improved uncued space surveillance capabilities. We are also relocating C-band radar to Australia. I was down there recently and uh, got to uh, talk to the Australians associated with where we are with that project in order to give our low Earth orbit coverage in the southern hemisphere and a major advance in geosynchronous space surveillance that was the last year's launch of two geosynchronous space situational awareness program satellites providing improved situational awareness out to 22,000 miles. Now these satellites will not only improve our ability to detect potential collisions, they will also increase our capability for detecting threats. To that end, these satellites have also the capability to perform rendezvous and proximity operations, enabling characterization, enhanced surveillance, and enhanced orbitable, or, orbital predictions. These are just a few of our initiatives, and while space situational awareness is an extremely important part of what we do, we can't do it alone. I am pleased to tell you that U.S. Strategic Command is also heavily involved in the efforts to promote openness, predictability, and transparency in space operations. We have a number of our allies and coalition partners working in the Joint Space Operations Center who participate in daily space operations and planning activities. Last year, we signed a Memorandum of Understanding allowing participating nations to leverage existing capabilities. And last month, we signed an arrangement with Germany to share space services and data, making them the eighth nation to participate in sharing agreements with the United States. We have also signed agreements with 46 commercial entities in 16 countries. Cataloging space objects, however, is not enough. We must be able to fuse all the data together from multiple sources to provide command and control in, near real, in a real near-time environment. This capability is coming with the Joint Space Operations Center Mission System, or JMS, as it's frequently called. The first phase to replace legacy equipment and software is already operating. The next evolution will be a battle management command and control system that will provide space situational awareness to other component commanders, joint task force commanders, the intelligence community, and our data sharing partners. The second opportunity we have been afforded is to address some of the doctrinal, cultural, programmatic, and organizational issues so we better prepare our space forces to operate in this environment of increasing threats. In addition to participating in the Defense Space Council, earlier this week, U.S. Strategic <coughs> Command held its first, its inaugural, space, Joint Space Doctrine and Tactics Forum. We gathered operational leaders from across the space enterprise and held some very candid discussions on how to best to synchronize our efforts and identify gaps in our capabilities to facilitate our long-term investments and associated solutions. For example, it was interesting to look at different ways to enhance existing satellite communication capabilities in contested and congested environments. Finally, we must ensure we maintain our advantage and to defend against space <coughs> threats and to operate in congested and, con and degraded environments and to ensure assured access to space for all. We must put a resilient and affordable space architecture in place. Because of the long but differing lifespans of our satellites, we have reached a point where we must recapitalize and reconstitute big chunks of our current space architecture, providing us a unique opportunity to evaluate our approach in a holistic manner. For example, just last week we launched the third Mobile User Objective Satellite System, or what we call MUOS, in a series of five, which will provide 
some tenfold the capability and capacity of the current UHF constellation. We must think creatively to make our systems more survivable, more resilient, and to host to include hosted payloads, lower cost satellites, cross domain solutions, and drawing on distributed international and commercial partner capabilities. To be successful, we will work to develop the most feasible, mission effective, and fiscally sound mix of the available alternatives. Now to aid with resiliency and in an effort to make this domain observable, we are incorporating modeling and simulating capabilities in our War Games Center at U.S. Strategic Command to provide us a venue that allows for further understanding, unfettered discussions, and informed decision making at the strategic and operational level. Now this is important to me because we must be able to visualize the effects of congested, contested and com in this competitive environment, particularly as we conduct exercises and improve or refine our operational concepts. We are, of course, facing these complex issues during a dynamic fiscal environment. When our national debt is more than $18 trillion and when budget uncertainty creates risk in our planning efforts. Now, I'm pleased to see the President's budget for FY16 recognizing the growing and dem demonstrated threats to our vital space assets and assets that our forces are relying upon being there. Now this budget increases additional investments aimed at addressing gaps and in innovations for space. Of course, we're in the early phases of the process, but let me be clear, any retrograde to the President's budget could jeopardize these investments and diminish our asymmetric advantages in space, exposing our nation to significant risk in this foundational area. We must also continue to experiment with new innovations. For example, the commercially hosted infrared payload, otherwise known as CHIRP, provided perhaps a viable affordable pathfinder option for future missile warning architecture. Similarly, ANGELS, or shall I say, the Automated Navigation and Guidance Experiment for Local Space is an Air Force Research Lab experiment which examines techniques for providing a clearer picture of the environment around our vital space assets, and that's showing promise. So I look forward to other experimentation that will ultimately allow us to think differently, maneuver differently, and maintain our advantages in space. Finally, as we go forward, we must include a deep understanding of the congruency of space and cyberspace. Both have a unique dependency on each other, and solutions must account for this. There's obviously lots of work underway and still much to do. But we have been operating in space for almost six decades, and we owe these efforts to our nation at large, as well as our joint operating force, which provide intricate operations that clearly <coughs> require space capability. Now, I've visited many of our sites and have spent time with these extraordinary men and women, and I could not be more proud of them or confident in their abilities. We must continue the momentum of new approaches and progress in space because assured Access to space is a requirement for U.S. warfighting forces. Operational imperatives must include flexible, agile, and adaptable thinking, a resilient, flexible, and affordable architecture, continued partnerships and sharing agreements, an acquisition strategy that will allow us to get defense spending right, and an international code of conduct for space that establishes norms for responsible behavior in space that are equitable, verifiable, and enhance all sec the security of all nations. As my good friend, Assistant Secretary Frank Rose from the Department of State has stated, quote, 
Today, the world is increasingly interconnected through and increasingly dependent on space systems. The risk associated with irresponsible actions in space mean that ins ensuring the long-term sustainability, stability, safety, and security of, space, of the space environment is in the vital interest of the entire world community. The work we all will do in responding to the challenges of and the threats to the space environment can help us preserve space for all nations and future generations." End quote. So thank you again for inviting me here, and I look forward to your questions. So uh, some over here in the port side. Right over Port side. <laughs> Hi, Admiral. I'm Pat Host with Defense Daily. I was wondering if you could tell me if Increment 2 for, G for JMS is still slated for 2016, and uh, are there any more increments? Is there an FOC for Increment 1 scheduled? Can you give us a little update? The uh, dates associated with JMS uh, uh, Joint uh, Space Operations Center mission system, I hate abbreviations, but um, it's moving along. As I mentioned, increment one is in place. I don't have right in front of me the FOC date for uh, w where we are with that. I do know and I've seen it in operation out there in Vandenberg. Uh, we continue to work toward increment two, uh, and I don't remember if it's 16 or 17, to be honest with you here, as we continue to work that piece, but it's moving at at the right clip. Uh, increment three is also in the planning process, and I'm excited about that part uh, because we've got to get this JMS uh, thing right. Uh, this business of being able to fuse information in a timely manner and be able to get it out where it matters is uh, critically important uh, for the future. And uh, thanks for asking that question because it's a very important system to us. Uh, and so far, and the reason I don't have all these dates memorized is when things are unplanned, I go work on something else. <laughs> yes? Sir, a little more of a, I guess, a Excuse fill of... A little more of a... Is it on? Yes. Yeah. Okay, philosophical question. Um, everyone benefits from space in the Department of Defense, the intelligence community. Um, the way it's working right now, the Air Force gets to pay for a lot of that as the executive agent for space. As you see needs growing in the future and opportunities for new ways of using space, do you see that construct maintaining where the Air Force is going to be um, the executive agent and paying for the, the majority of that? Or do you see something where um, the Navy or the Army sees a value for something and they go pay for this that capability themselves. I mean, how is the fairness going to work in the future as we continue to use space more increasingly? That's a good question. Uh, uh, right now, I think using uh, things like the Defense Space Council and, as, and uh, as you allude to, there are a lot of investments from the Air Force perspective in space, but I uh, will say both the Army uh, and the Navy have associated investments as well. Uh, the key as we work through this is really making sure we are having joint solutions to where they're glued together. And that's where I think the business of uh, how we have this battle rhythm of meetings in this <coughs> Defense Space Council is important. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the uh, this uh, joint space doctrine and training forum that I'm leading uh, is another piece of getting all the key players together in order to look at things like that for the future. I don't sense that, you know, there's a move to bundle it all up here in the near term in some other new fashion, uh, but I will say I'm pleased to report the cross talk and collaboration across the different stakeholders has uh, just continues to improve 
and uh, really proud of the players that uh, I get to meet with and, and operate with uh, and, and, and discuss the issues in this domain uh, in a collaborative way. Um, <clears throat> morning, Admiral Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. Um, I uh, don't want to put words in your mouth, but uh, your, your uh, discussion about uh, uh, small satellites, nano satellites, CubeSats, uh, could be interpreted by some as uh, expressing concerns that this is not a way ahead. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of excitement generated over the last few years about that approach. Um, are they, is space so congested at this point that uh, we should abandon it? Or go ahead and let us know what you really meant to say. Mm -hmm. Well, whenever you say anything, it can be interpreted one way or the other. Uh, but quite frankly, if you take what I said in combination, I hope you understand that I uh, discuss this business of what we have and to be able to maneuver through space with lots of things we have to be careful with and we have to recognize that piece. On the other hand, I spoke a lot about innovation. And quite frankly, I think it's very important that we look at innovative solutions. And a lot of those small satellites that are up there today are from a variety of different nations doing experimentation. And uh, that, to me, is a good thing. It's just as we look at being able to see the number of things, it's a pretty amazing. I don't have a picture for you today. And if I had a picture, it couldn't be a static picture. It would have to be a live picture for you to really see these things that move around at incredible speeds that are up there. That's what we have to be mindful of in terms of things. Anything producing that has a potential to produce more debris, uh, we have to have methodologies and procedures and collaborative and transparency in order to prevent more debris from being up in space. Uh, the numbers are just continuing to grow and the rate of change there is in fact disturbing. So it's more about the management of all this so that we can reduce the potential for collisions while at the same time being able to work to innovate as we must do. You got to wait for the mic, I'm told here. So. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about the space capabilities of VEOs that you find most concerning and what you're doing to counter those capabilities. Well, the, uh, it's no secret, quite frankly, in terms of the, uh, the uh, and that's why I always talk about the congruency of space and cyber together, in terms of you don't have to have a tremendous landline network in order to move information or misinformation around. And violent extremist organizations are taking advantage of those kinds of capabilities, uh, quite frankly. Now, for me to tell you what we're doing to counter that would require a different classification level, and I won't do that here. Just know that uh, that's on the radar screen, and, and uh, many folks are working on that particular problem. Yeah, you, you have the mic, so just pick oh, one. Oh, I just wanted you to give me. Uh, hi, <coughs> hi, Admiral. Uh, Mark Selinger with Aerospace America. Um, some of the satellites you mentioned, including the Muos-3, uh, were launched on the Atlas V rocket, which has been powered by the Russian RD-180 engine, and now the Air Force is looking to move away from that engine and, and develop some new engines. I was wondering if you have any concerns that while solving one problem, which is dependence on Russia, that there may be some new problems because with any new um, engine or, or system that you develop, there could be techno uh, technological glitches. Uh, so do you have any concerns with this change that's uh, unfolding? <laughs> well, uh, I am a big fan that we have to have diversity in terms of uh, our supply chain in all of our sophisticated technology that we uh, operate with or build, et cetera. And that's just sort of foundational as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the piece of having technical challenges, I mean, that to me is what America is about, the business of being able to look uh, square in the face, uh, a sorted amount of technical and uh, very complex issues. And uh, to me, we have to work our way through that, just as we've done through so many different uh, areas requiring exquisite technology. <coughs> uh, 
thank you again for, for coming and addressing us. I had a question uh, related to what keeps you up at night. Uh, as you think about uh, the myriad threats that you have to think about as commander of STRATCOM, uh, one of the primary missions is the deterrent mission, uh, and there's emerging capabilities from a number of players around the world. Uh, as you think about the space side of that equation, what's most concerning to you? Well, most concerning to me, and if there was something keeping me up at night, when I finally do go horizontal, I have the God-given ability to just shut down <laughs> first. But uh, what, what does bother me, quite frankly, is uh, our budget environment. And to me, that is, uh, has uh, so much chaos in it of unpredictability, as well as we are under the Budget Control Act. Sequestration is the law. We have to do better than that in terms of things. So this president's budget that was just uh, uh, unveiled here at the beginning of the week, very important to me that we we're able to get that money. But on the longer term, we have to have something better than this Budget Control Act so that we can efficiently and effectively plan in order to address the threats of the future. Yeah, associated with that also is those things that the military has put on the table that we want to divest ourselves from have to also be acted upon because it, it's almost a double handcuff, if you will, in terms of things. So I know we have some congressional staff here. I hope you will consider that as you do your day job here uh, in terms of just how important that is for the United States of America and those folks that are on the front line on the pointy end of the sphere doing the missions we are out and about doing in this complex world we live in. Thank you for that question. Hi, Jordana Mishori with Inside the Pentagon. You mentioned at the very tail end of your speech about acquisition reform. And I was just wondering, what specifically do you hope will get changed in acquisition? And how do you hope that that will help you acquire what you need to uh, with satellites or with STRATCOM in general? Acquisition reform uh, covers a lot of bases. Uh, that will take another half an hour. Just kidding, Pam. But the, uh, for me, uh, in terms of things, is uh, being able to have uh, a, a good understanding in a timely manner and, and timely decisions uh, that we can go through. It's interesting in how we can become slaves to what I call the tyranny of the, of the program of record. Uh, those of us who have worked in requirements know how this journey starts way left over here. The world's still spinning, it changes, and you gotta get capability oh, you know, that can't wait for way over here. So we gotta reduce this acquisition cycle to where it's meaningful while at the same time do the necessary, the necessary, and only the necessary push-ups in order to move forward would be my sort of overarching piece of this. Obviously with, uh, you know, uh, checks and balances associated with uh, to ensure we have the right uh, responsible uh, alternative looks to make sure we're heading down a path. And then I think some of the things we have done uh, more uh, recently over the years is looking at not just <coughs> what's the price to, to buy object A, B, or C, or tool A, B, and C, but what's the price tag to sustain it and uh, to ensure that that's being thought of in the early design so that we can have uh, a more affordable solution throughout the lifespan of uh, the particular technology. Hi, Admiral uh, James Drew from uh, Inside the Air Force. Um, I would like to ask you just about the nuclear forces. So, um, the uh, FY16 budget that uh, included the uh, the cruise missile. It also included the new Minuteman, and you've also got the uh, higher class replacement, the Trident, and a few other things. Um, and, and kind of right across the board modernization going on there. And with, with these tight budgets and, and the problems uh, that you're having on Capitol Hill, um, how are you going to keep these all going um, as, the, as these programs ramp up? 
and uh, is there anything that you would you could do without or is there anything that is critical yeah, thank you for that question uh, even though it's a little deviation from the space form but since I do lead uh, in uh, the outfit that's responsible and have responsibilities associated with having a space safe secure and effective strategic deterrent for our nation that includes its nuclear deterrent force uh, I would just say uh, you can't uh, uh, not invest in these kinds of capabilities when you look at uh, the modernization of strategic forces uh, of other nations. Uh, and uh, although we are working as the nuclear uh, uh, NPR, the nuclear uh, posture review uh, stated, in order to work towards uh, having lesser role of nuclear weapons, the fact of the matter is we still have uh, countries that have either aspired to have capability or uh, countries that have modernized their capability, countries that are uh, actually uh, showing off their capability in some of the uh, 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 very uh, concerning ways, particularly as we look at things of having uh, strategic operation nuclear force exercises by the Russians during the Crimea and Ukraine uh, crises, for example, long-range aircraft flying in air defense identification zones of many of the nations, uh, interfering with uh, air traffic and what have you. Uh, this is an area that uh, we have pushed to, right, to the right, the modernization of this capability to the point where we cannot, we can ill afford to continue to do that. So those investments you see in there uh, are required from my perspective as a combatant commander in order to uh, do my number one mission to deter strategic attack against the United States of America, our homeland, and to deter attack against our allies. And if deterrence fails, to be able to provide options to our national security apparatus, including the President. I don't have an option associated with that. And I would just say it's not an area that we can just wish away. Uh, we have to invest in those kinds of capabilities. And space is also linked to that list of capabilities. So thank you for the question. Peter. Let me ask you the last question. Can you? Are you going to be restricted for the yeah, mic, too? So. <laughs> <laughs> no. Could, You're getting your exercise today. <laughs> could you address SIBRS in terms of where we are and how we're going on that? And the other thing is long range pump, conventional strike, the extent to which it's linked to space. Could you comment on that as well? And then we'll conclude. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. As you know, Peter's going to ask a few hard questions. <laughs> uh, first, uh, uh, now I've forgotten your question. Sibbers, Sibbers. <laughs> The uh, Sibbers is moving along, uh, and quite frankly, it's nice to see the platforms we have up there. We still have some investments that need to be done, particularly rela relating to the ground stations and what have you, associated with being able to move the, the associated information. And uh, there's good work going on in that direction today. Uh, great capability that we must have. When I talk about the strategic nuclear deterrent, a lot of folks just focus on the triad of capabilities. Uh, I always like to start to the far left of that, in the business that we have to invest in the right amount of, uh, of uh, intelligence so that we know what's going to happen well before it occurs. And then we have to have the requisite amount of sensors out there, like SIBRS, space-based infrared radar, such that we can sense uh, a launch anywhere in the world and be able to take that information and move it to associated watch centers and decision makers, uh, which requires a uh, national and nuclear command and control uh, apparatus uh, before you even get to the triad part of the business. So SIBRS is a big deal for me, very important, and uh, it is good to see it uh, on track uh, as a, a replacement capability for a DSP satellite constellation. Uh, with regards to prompt global strike, uh, that's another area where we've done uh, some uh, experimentation in a variety of different ways. 
in areas. Clearly in war fighting today, we've gotten better and better at precision uh, munitions. And this is another area where we have uh, more work to do, uh, but it's an area that I uh, fully support that we work towards in a thoughtful and affordable way uh, because we have other countries that are, in fact, investing in that kind of capability. <coughs> so I would just like to say, since Peter said that was the last question, uh, that I thank you all for the work that you do day in and day out uh, for our country, wherever you worked at, that brought you here today. And on behalf of uh, our joint military force, those sailors, soldiers, airmen, Marines, and those civilians that are sometimes forgotten about that are so important. Um, I uh, really want to thank them publicly for all they do for our nation, not just the ones that work at U.S. Strategic Command, but those that work across our Department of Defense uh, for the security of our nation. Thank you.